All right, well, we're back on Courtroom Chronicles with the County Attorney. Welcome, everyone. We're, as usual, here with County Attorney Ken Volkmer, and we have a very special guest here, our Major Crimes Deputy County Attorney, Lauren Deacon, coming into the hot seat today. Welcome, Lauren. I'm sure you're thrilled to be here. Thank you. I am thrilled. And the reason you're here is a lot in the news you see advancements in technology, artificial intelligence. You, you see and hear about it all the time. Uh, we, even though we're not going to talk about AI today, um, that might be something that down the line helps us. But now we have technology that's advanced over the past 10 or 20 years that really helps us to solve cases. And Lauren did an excellent job, um, relatively speaking, on a, a case you recently prosecuted that involved a lot of technology. Without going too much into the details, how important was um, cell phone data and just the use of technology in this case we're going to talk about? It was the bulk of our evidence. We're dealing with teenagers, so technology was the evidence. And without it? I don't know that we could have proved the case without it. And Ken, is that true, or to what extent is that true with, with a lot of cases we deal with? So, I, I mean, as you know, we continue to, to really live our lives through our phones and have cameras everywhere, um, what's happened is we now have a much more sophisticated audience who demands more evidence. Uh, and most of our lives, most of our interactions, good, bad, or indifferent, they're contained in our phones. Uh, and frankly, most places you go, there's videotape. So most cases now, we, we want to be able to demonstrate that there's some cell phone evidence as well as some potentially video evidence. And that's what our juries are demanding. In this case in particular, I, I agree with Lauren. I don't think we could have got a conviction without it. And this case is tragic at least to me, for for a lot of reasons. But Lauren, you're the expert here. But it was, I think, September of, of 2021. I think um, deputies are called out because of a, a shooting in the middle of the day. And I think it's a pretty just, you know, average run of the mill, well to do neighborhood in Santan Valley. It was. It was a neighborhood in Santan Valley. And there was a call at 1.11 p.m. that shots were fired. And there was a 15 year old boy dead in his doorway. And not just dead in his doorway, tragic in and of itself. Um, I think was the the victim's brother even home and heard that maybe didn't to what extent he saw it. I'm not sure, but at least heard his brother get get shot. He heard and saw, and he was trying to perform CPR while on the, making the 911 call, even though his brother was already deceased. So deputies show up, and it's it, it, at least at this moment they don't yet know who would want to do this, who would want to gun down the. Uh, uh, nice kid in, in, in his doorway. I mean, that's as cold-blooded as I can can come up with. I mean, what what are deputies doing when they arrive on scene, and how do they start to kind of piece this case together? You know, it actually took a little while. They arrived on scene, and they're just trying to figure out if there's still a suspect nearby. So they set up a perimeter to figure out which way somebody might have gone, um, how many shots were there, who saw what, gathering as much information from the older brother, from neighbors. Then the parents came home once they heard what happened. Um, just trying to figure out who could have done this. And to be just to make it clear, I mean, because the, the suspect had left. I mean, wasn't around the front door, wasn't hanging out, wasn't readily in that area. Correct. He had fled um, actually before the brother called 911. And Kent, I know you were alerted to this case early on. I mean, when you hear about a 15 year old shot dead in his doorway, I mean, what kind of goes through your mind? I mean, look, I have a 14 year old son myself. Um, it, it just, it strikes close to home. You want to know what happened. You want to know why it happened. Uh, what I can tell you is, um, you know, the residents of Pinal County are really fortunate because we have a tremendous law enforcement community. Um, you know, part of their information gathering, you know, they, they wasted no time. They immediately started canvassing the area. Um, they were working three or four different angles all at the same time uh, because, again, this is a shock to the community. This is it's a 15-year-old kid that, that died in his own house. And Lauren, kind of run me through, how do we come up with a suspect name and where does this rabbit hole kind of take us? So the suspect's name was first mentioned by some other teenagers to one of the law enforcement officers who was helping to hold the perimeter. There wasn't much teeth to the name at that point. It was really the... Um, cell phone location data that honed in on the suspect. And do you, I guess we'll clear this up now. What, what, what was the suspect's name? His name is Joshua Franklin. And the victim in this case was Joshua McCoy. Correct. Both 15 and going forward, we'll call the victim Joshua and uh, the defendant, Defendant Franklin, just so everyone uh, watching this or listening to this has a, has a clear distinction between the two. So law enforcement hears about Defendant Franklin uh, but he, he wasn't at the scene. Uh, so how do you prove? I mean, you might think, hey, you know, it might have been him. But how do they go about tracking him down, figuring out if he was 
the the person there and not to, to put a ton on your plate but also why would defendant franklin want to kill this nice 15 year old kid who he I, I think he barely knew correct so they went to different high schools um, and their paths crossed in the business of selling and buying um, vape cartridges for vape pens. Most of them were nicotine. There may have been some that were THC as well. So that's how their paths crossed. Um, that day, Josh was going to be giving Franklin one um, and it, to make up for a broken one previously. So at 11 o'clock that morning, um, Josh gave Franklin his home address. We started to gather all this information, or not by we, I mean law enforcement, because um, right near Josh's body on the couch was his phone. And between the phone itself and get, downloading that and looking at the contents of the phone, as well as interviews, especially with his good buddy, they started to learn that Snapchat was key in this case. And so they knew to hone in on Snapchat. And what was on was it this the messaging on snapchat um what what did they find so it was a combination of things the messaging on snapchat because that was how franklin and josh uh communicated that day was via snapchat so it was the actual content of the messages the existence of calls made through snapchat between individuals but most importantly the location data We'll get to the location data here in a second, but the the messages between them were essentially what they were setting up this this deal with the vape cartridge, correct? Or they were indicating they were going to meet up to some degree. Correct. The messages between the two of them, there was actually only one message that we recovered directly from Snapchat, which Snapchat has a lot more than a user thinks they do. Um, the users see it all disappear, but they don't actually all disappear. So we did have one message, but what we also had was Josh was communicating with his best buddy and sort of business partner uh, about this simultaneously. So he's sort of narrating what's going on to his buddy, and that helped us. That would indicate there was going to be some exchange of this cartridge which with Defendant Franklin. Yes, that he was coming over, and then there was a specific one when he was – when Defendant Franklin was 10 minutes away. And um, before we go on, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but uh, on the note that you just brought up, uh, Lauren, Kent, I thought when you delete stuff on Snapchat, it's it's gone. I didn't, I didn't realize you could use it against me in a criminal case. Oh, we can and we do. Um, you know, I, I think it is important that, that people understand, though, that um, law enforcement doesn't just have carte blanche access uh, to your emails, to your phone, to those type of things. I mean, there are certain protections that, that are put in place uh, that you have certain constitutional guarantees to the right to privacy, et cetera. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is law enforcement actually has to build a case first, and then they have to seek a warrant, then they have to provide a warrant. I mean, we have the ability to ask them to preserve evidence, but Snapchat doesn't give it to us because we ask for it. Right. Yeah. Snapchat will only give it to us when we have a court order saying you must give it to us or pay the consequences. Um, but, yeah, a lot of these that you think just because you hit delete, sometimes it goes away, sometimes it doesn't. And, Lauren, back to this investigation. You, so you have some of these messages that, that certainly seem uh, like red flags, right? Like you have uh, a conversation uh, referencing Defendant Franklin potentially coming to the house with this vape cartridge. doesn't necessarily prove Defendant Franklin did it. Um from what I remember in this case, I think law enforcement, they actually, I think, even put put it out on social media. There was like a, a video of, you couldn't really tell who it was, but um, I don't know if you recall the video better than I did, but it was like somebody on a scooter or something like that. And I think they asked for help identifying who it was, but you didn't, didn't really have a good look at who it is. Correct. So like Kent mentioned, I believe, was that the law enforcement was canvassing the neighborhoods, not only for witness eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. but for any video that they may have from Ring. Um, doorbell cameras or anything like that. And there was one showing an individual dressed all in black, including his face, the person's face covered on this black, we called it a scooter. I, I don't know if it's supposed to be a scooter or a bike, but um, passing by this park just down the road from Josh's house minutes before Josh was murdered. So what does law enforcement do with that? They're hearing this name, Defendant Franklin. There's this video of somebody on a bike, scooter, whatever you want to call it. How do you really hone in on Defendant Franklin as the person to be able to say, not only we think you did this, but but we're pretty sure you are the shooter here? So it was a couple of things simultaneously. They were working a lot of different angles at the same time. So they took a still from that video and put that out uh, to the public asking for help on identifying who that might be. Simultaneously, they were building the case, like Kent said, to be able to get that court order for Snapchat, but then also for the service provider. So here, T-Mobile, 
for Franklin's phone. So they did that. They had enough uh, probable cause to get those court orders to get that information. What they got from Snapchat and from T-Mobile, uh, what was part of that was location data. And so they were able to see where Franklin's phone was around the time of the murder. And we have it up on the screen for those watching online, but for those listening, explain to us what we're looking at here when you when law enforcement was able to see that location data of the phone, What what is it that they're actually looking at? Right, so this is um, a compilation, like a visualization made by an analyst over at the Sheriff's Department who was one of our key witnesses at trial. He put this together that shows there are dots that are showing the location data from Snapchat. Um, They're pretty precise. Um, Those are on there overlaid also with the T-Mobile timing advance data is what they call it. And those are the ones that are showing as like arcs. Um, showing how Franklin, or at least his phone, was moving that day from Franklin's home to Josh's home and back to Franklin's home. We also then put that together with the video surveillance because the timing of that matched as well. And as a prosecutor, I guess for both of you, when when you're looking at the compilation of this evidence, specifically the cell phone data, um, how big of a deal is that? It's huge. Everything matched. Everything put together. It's kind of like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And you've got your Snapchat data. You've got your T-Mobile data. You have the surveillance video. You have the content of the messages and the timing of those eyewitness accounts, the timing of the 911 call. And you put it all in a timeline and it meshes perfectly to show that it all goes together. Because without that cell phone data, Ken, if you want to explain to it, how big of a, I mean, like not all puzzle pieces are the same size. So how big of a puzzle piece is that cell phone data in this case? So it's as close to irrefutable as, as we can produce. Uh, but I'd really ask you to think about the converse. Imagine we didn't have any of that da- data. If we didn't have cell phone going back and forth so we didn't have anybody to look at, if we didn't have the the Ring video footage where it actually shows somebody there, if we didn't have the Snapchat data, if we didn't have the T-Mobile data, if we had none of that information, what we have is we'd have a 15-year-old who was shot in his doorway. We'd have his brother who could not identify the suspect who, you know, is, is... torn with guilt and and was in an emotional wreck. And we would have uh, essentially that there was somebody that may have been mad at him because there was an issue with a a vape cartridge. That would have been the closest that we'd have had to any evidence to point to the actual defendant and ultimately the killer in this case. So if you take away all of that data, if this would have happened, say, in in 1985, um, I I think you'd have a killer on the loose. Because even if you had that initial person to law enforcement, uh, hey, I think, you know, maybe defendant Franklin was involved. Well, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't get you to charge this case or prosecute this case, right? Not even close. It wouldn't have even gotten the police the search warrant for the Franklin house that they ultimately got based on the location data. Without the location data, they would never have even been able to look in the home for the other pieces of evidence. So law enforcement hones in on defendant Franklin. Um, what What's the resolution of this case? What, what's he charged with? What, what happens at the end of this case? So he was charged with uh, first degree murder, premeditated murder, as well as burglary. Um, for entering the home to commit with the purpose of committing a crime. He was convicted on both counts, and he was sentenced as well to lifetime. But for a juvenile, it's 25 to life. So after serving 25 years, he does have the possibility of, of ending the sentence for his murder conviction. But the judge did stack 10 and a half years for the burglary on top of it. So he will be serving at least 35 and a half years in prison. Yeah, I was going to say for us layman folk, it's at least 35 years in prison before he even has an opportunity to get us. So he'd be in his 40s. Correct. He was 16 at the time of the conviction. And I guess question for both of you, what you have a 15 year old who was murdered over a vape cartridge. I don't know how much vape cartridges cost, uh, but you have a 15 year old who was killed over a vape cartridge. How does that hit you? It's gut wrenching. I mean, Josh said his whole stash was worth about $200. Um, And so at most, if he was wanting the whole stash, it was over $200. And after the verdict came out, Josh's mom was in the courtroom and She even said all she could be thinking about was Franklin's parents, because like you said earlier, two lives are lost in this. Kent, I know that you started to talk about you have a son yourself. Yeah, I mean, 
think of all the lives that are permanently impacted. Josh McCoy lost his life. Josh Franklin's going to spend the rest of his, the majority of the rest of his life in prison. Cer- certainly some of his best years. Yeah. Absolutely. You've got um, Josh's brother, Josh McCoy's brother, who saw his little brother and heard him gunned down and found him and tried to, to resuscitate him. You've got a mom and a dad who are never getting over this on both sides. So this doesn't just impact two people. This impacts dozens of people that, that were friends and knew the two parties, and, and these, these souls are effectively lost. And over $20 for a vape cartridge, even if, if it was the whole stash, $200, I, I just – Two hundred dollars, and Lauren, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I know we—I know Josh's family is at least aware we're doing this episode, so we're not um, going to surprise them by this by any means. But uh, I know you were close with the family, um, and uh, Josh, anything you want to say just about him as a as a kid? And I know his family, as, as both of you have alluded to, is just uh, obviously their their lives are forever altered by this. They are. They're, they're devastated. Um, Josh sounds like he was an amazing kid. From what his mom and his brother told me, um, he was somebody that everybody loved. He was really into basketball, um, and he is missed terribly, that's for sure. Absolutely. And um, Kent, I don't want to go down a, a whole separate rabbit hole because we answered a lot of this on uh, another episode, previous episode that we've talked about. But um, I know uh, some folks will have the question here when it comes to juvenile charging um, in its simplest terms, uh, Defendant Franklin, uh, yes, he was 15. Um, why was he charged as an adult? I mean, you didn't really have, I, I guess for both of you can answer this. I mean, there is no discretion, right? If you're 15 right. for first or second degree murder, you're automatically tri- or, uh, charged as an adult? Correct. 15, 16, and 17, you're charged as an adult. It's called an automatic transfer. That's There's not really discretion. Uh, if they're under the age of 15, there is some discretion. You can look at it. Uh, but ultimately, when he was placed in adult court and charged as an adult, the consequences, all of those things are sort of set in stone. Um, so we talked about that 25 to life just moments ago. That's not something that we choose. That's not something that the court chooses. That's a legislative um, result. That, that is something that's been passed by our state legislature. So if you are that 15, 16, actually 15 or older, you're going to be charged as an adult. If you're convicted, you're going to be looking at um, potentially a life sentence. If you are 15, 16, or 17, there's a slightly different change in the sentence, and that is that eligibility be to release after 25 years. Uh, if you're 18 or older, that, that eligibility no longer exists. Cool. Lauren, you're the expert on this case. What am I missing? I don't think you're missing ever- anything. It was an extremely tragic case that was solved by some amazing work from our sheriff's department, putting together all of these pieces. It took them three weeks to be able to get the evidence that they needed to actually have a solid suspect. And so Nobody was rushing to it. They did their work. They did it thoroughly. And because of that, then we also had a thorough prosecution. As as previously alluded to, because we've talked about this on another episode, but this is yet another example of, you know, teen violence that we've talked about. We have a whole episode dedicated just to teen violence. Look, I did things at the age of 15 that if we're made public, I may not be working here. <laughs> uh, so you would not be certainly not out to, to, to judge, you know, anybody, but I mean, you see like in this instance, you have at least defendant Franklin using a gun, uh, over a very small transaction. I mean, what is just maybe the message to, to parents? How do we reach our youth? How do we get them to not resort to guns over, you know, uh, trivial matters? You know, I, I'll jump in here. Um, it, it just has to do with the valuation of human life. Uh, the reality is, you know, we've seen a difference in our society and our culture since COVID. Um, you know, we talked about another episode, we talked about teen violence, but we have seen the systematic devaluation of humans. I mean, this, again, at, at the end of the day, for $20 to $200, that was what somebody's life was valued at. Uh, that is it's just unacceptable. Um, it, it's something that, that I think we need to consciously as a community lift up people, lift up humanity and, and the inherent value that every human being has. And maybe somebody you don't like, maybe somebody that screwed you over on a deal, the solution isn't to execute them. Um, that ruins everyone's life. And I, I think we just have to really continue to push that, that there's value in all of humanity. Yeah. And Lauren, I, I guess I'll end that with you just cause you, you deal with a lot of these cases where, you know, kids, youth are involved, um, your message. I would echo what Kent said. Um, There, a loss of any life is tragic, but when I'm, most of my cases, I'm dealing with loss of very young lives that will never know what what they could have done. 
just like Josh. And I agree that you need to make sure folks understand the value of a human life, no matter who they are, that quite frankly, they're invaluable and execution is not the answer. And at least fortunately in this case, technology, um, I guess I'll end it where we started, but fortunately in this case, where it's 2024 at the time, you know, 2021, 2022. So we have, you know, at least the tools available to, to hold, you know, in this case, defendant Franklin accountable. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I alluded to it earlier. If this happened in the 80s, we probably don't get a conviction. In fact, if you look sort of locally, if you look at the state level and you look at the national level, the um, the rate of conviction, the rate of actually holding people accountable and solving homicides and serious offenses has grown exponentially in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, that is due in large part to technology. Um, this is just one example that really kind of reflects that because, again, without technology, there would have never been a conviction. You know, Josh McCoy's family would still be wondering, um, what happened? What happened to my son? Why did it happen to my son? Now, obviously, it doesn't make it any easier, but at least they have some answers now that they wouldn't have had. And, and I'm not going to go off on a, another tangent, but you just think about, I mean, we didn't know where we'd be 20 years ago technologically. It, it's kind of fascinating where we might be it, even five or 10 years from now, from, from your perspective in terms of prosecuting cases, the types of evidence you might be looking at from a technological standpoint. I'm sure you're very interested to see what's around the corner. We will not get to the minority report stage, though. So, so, so don't <laughs> the don't screens flying that. around. <laughs> yes. I, pre pre crime and all of this. That. This may not age well, though. If when, <laughs> when we've got the screens, the Apple Vision Pro, all the yeah. So, well, anyways, um, I know maybe not the the happiest of cases to talk about, but a, a successful prosecution due to having the tech. Uh, technological advances and technological components to this. And Lauren, want to thank you for for stopping by. How do you uh, how do you feel? Thanks for having me. This is fun. It's good right. to be here. I appreciate your time and Kent as always. And for all of you who watched or listened to this, we'll we'll see you next time on Courtroom Chronicles with the County Attorney.